Shall we start, ma'am? Yes, uh, I'm Dr. Rakshita O.P. Hello, I'm audible? Yes. Um, so I'm Dr. Rakshita O.P. Uh, I'm working as a consultant, uh, cornea and refractive at uh, Netradama Bangalore. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, my paper today is on retinoscopic dilemma and abnormal contour of the retina, a case series. So as we know, retinoscopy is very um, satisfactory and the accurate method for the objective determination of the refraction. It plays a very important role in the preoperative evaluation of a patient who's seeking the refractive surgery. So it's important to synchronize both the subjective as well as the retinoscopic values, both pre and post cycloplegia, so that we can avoid the under or the overcorrection. So uh, here we're presenting uh, three cases where the unilateral difference between retinoscopic and the subjective refraction was noted uh, due to the altered macula contour which was diagnosed based on OCT. So uh, the aim of this report is to describe the surprising retinoscopic findings in the myopic patients who had come for the refractive surgery evaluation at our tertiary IK center. So the first case she was a 33 year old female Aspiring for the refractive surgery, she had the stable refraction for two years and her corneal tomography and the fundus examination was normal. Uh, she was accepting in the right eye minus 6, minus 0.5 at 50 and left eye minus 4, minus 0.5 at 20. But her retinoscopy in the left eye was minus 1. So we thought it must be because of the accommodative excess and then we started on the cycloplegic for two weeks and uh, even after two weeks it remained the same. Then we started on atropine and waited for two weeks, but again it was the same. So then, sorry, <laughs> then um, the OCT was ordered just to rule out any posterior segment pathology. So we found out there was the altered macula contour. So the surprising uh, results were because of the relatively posterior position of the fovea compared to the adjacent area of the macula. So this was post cycloplegic. So the subject to acceptance was the same, minus seven and minus four. Uh, when we're doing the retinoscope in the primary position, it was again minus one in the left eye. But when we changed the angle according to the dome, uh, based on the OCT changes, uh, it was corresponding with the subjective refraction. So uh, the diagnosis of left eye compound myopic astigmatism with the altered macular contour was uh, done and the patient underwent refractive surgery without any uh, refractive surprises. So these are the other two cases where we had the similar finding that is there was a difference between the subjective and the retinoscopic findings and similarly we got the OCT done where you can see the red, uh, altered macula contour. So the dome shaped macula is a distinct entity which is characterized by the convex elevation of the macula in the high myopia. So this elevation is often negligible on the fundus examination or the ultrasonography but it can be clearly detected on OCT. So also a recent study suggests it's mainly because of the uh, differential elongation of the eye, predominantly in the peridome region. Uh, so as you can see here, the retinoscopy reflects falling on the adjacent area of the fovea, which was relatively anterior to the fovea. That led to the lesser retinoscopic value in our cases. But on changing the angle of the retinoscopy, it was corresponding with the subjective refraction. So this case series mainly it highlights the pivotal role of retinoscopy in suspecting the altered macular contour in myopic patients. So uh, I would like to conclude by saying if there is in case a unilateral retinoscopic value less than the subjective which was not relieved by the cycloplegia then we can consider the altered uh, retinal contour. So changing the retinoscopic position would help in such cases and refractive surgery can be planned based on uh, the subjective refraction. Thank you. Can you tell us what led you to change the retinoscopic position? What made you suspect that in these three cases the contour yes, would be altered? Ma'am, because um, uh, since we started on the cycloplegia, but still we had the same findings. There was no, there was a difference between the subjective and the retinoscopic values. So then on the OCT, when we found out there is an altered macular contour, okay. so we thought we should you know try the change the angle of the retinoscopy and probably we'll try out good good idea only thing is your number of cases is a bit less yes. to make yes. it a valid so series you uh, need more your objective and subjective refraction doesn't matches so you suggest ocd for all patients 
uh, ma'am usually the initial what would think would be the uh, accommodative axis so we'll usually start them with the cycloplegic but in case if it's not relieved by the cycloplegia then maybe better we uh, order an oct and look at, have a look at it and if oct is not available maybe you can change your angle and angle look at it right. Yes, uh, just do it. Possible. Even yeah. without doing OCT, yeah. you can just try doing yeah. that. The so change good, in the uh, good idea. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. you. Ma'am? Yes. The post-operatively, uh, there was no refractive surprises, ma'am. It was fine. So the message that you are trying to give through this case series? So because in case, uh, before the correction, in case if there's a change in the subjective and the objective refraction, so we should we would be confused, is it just a pseudomyopia or is it something else? Because before correcting, we need to know the exact value. Uh, so, uh, so identifying a dome, is it going to change your refractive plan? Because your last point suggested refractive surgery should be done based on subjective refraction. So how this finding is going to help us in that? I mean, at least we'll <laughs> get to know what uh, what is the reason behind this. So, and if you know the reason, is it going to benefit you in any way in planning your treatment? Uh, but uh, again, if the subjective refraction changes, I think the treatment plan is not going to change. But I appreciate your effort because this may be a new field. Okay, you okay. need to explore more such cases. All right. Three cases may not be sufficient That's enough, sufficient. but I should. I think you should keep. At least the idea data is original. At least no? the idea is original. Yes. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. Can Thank we go to you. the Thank next, you. please? Because you know, in the end, then we rush, run yeah, short no, of time, time, and we don't do justice yeah, to yeah, those yeah, people. Yeah. So, can one of you invite the next person? Uh, I'll invite uh, Dr. Karishma Goyal, the next author, uh, to come. Is she there? Yeah, okay, please come. Good afternoon all. I am here to talk about the outcome. So, this is, yeah. If it if it is going to take uh, too much time, then we can invite the next speaker. Dr. Pratirup, are you there? You can, could you just check if your PPT is there? If it is fine in the meantime. Then try it. If it is, if it takes too too much time, then even yeah. Good afternoon all. I am here to present the outcomes of simultaneous versus sequential patching in cases of unilateral amblyopia. To start with, amblyopia is a condition in which someone experiences poor vision without having any organic cause. 
MDIOP is one of the major cause for vision impairment in children with uh, prevalence around 1 to 5 percent. Normally, brain and eye works together to produce vision. When this harmony breaks, amblyopia occurs. So brain-eye coordination is very essential for binocular vision. When someone with lazy eye observes an object, his brain ignores the signal from weaker eye and processes information only from the other eye. So what can be done in such cases? There are two major treatment pillars in amblyopia. One is the spectacle correction, another one is the occlusion therapy. Our treatment uh, uses two approaches, simultaneous treatment and sequential treatment. In simultaneous treatment, initiation of full-time spectacle wear started with occlusion, occlusion of non-amblyopic eye on the same sitting first visit. While in sequential treatment, initiation of full-time glasses wear was started on first visit, while on next visit, part-time occlusion of non-amblyopic eye was started. Now coming to the another important aspect of our study, stereopsis, which means depth perception. As our eyes are located closely adjacent to each other, we can see objects simultaneously but at slightly different angle. So at the time of fusion, these two disparate images combine to produce one image with all the similarities as well as slight disparities. Because of this, we can appreciate uh, depth and perceive the three dimension. Objective of our study is to evaluate whether either of the two treatment strategies provide better treatment outcome for amblyopia in terms of visual acuity and stereopsis. In this comparative study, children between 3 to 12 years age with unilateral amblyopias were included and all other amblyopias uh, other than strabismic and anisometropic were excluded from the study. Follow-up was done every six weeks up to the six months. 51 patients assigned in each group and compared for further results. There was no significant difference was found uh, between both the groups in terms of age, sex, family history type and severity of amblyopia. But there was significant improvement in visual acuity, stereopsis and interocular difference in both the groups. The change in uh, log stereopsis from first visit to last visit between both the groups was found significant while the change in visual acuity and interocular difference was insignificant. Here we can clearly appreciate that with almost the same range and mean stereopsis at first visit, there is better improvement of stereopsis in sequential treatment group. So our study addresses the uh, decrease in suppression and improvement in binoculologist which can create bias in the reporting outcomes. Also, same test for stereopsis was not used at each visit, which can also create error in the results. And there was a lack of objective measure for the data uh, about the use and adherence of glasses and patching as these uh, data was self-reported by the parents only. We are in process to overcome these limitations and put forward an error-free data. Still, with our results, we can conclude in sequential treatment with a uh, period of uninterrupted spectacle wear enhance the uh, recovery of stereopsis and binocularity better and decrease the suppression of amblyopic eye. Thank you. Could, uh, could you tell us what would be the reason for this difference between sequential and simultaneous? Ma'am, in sequential treatment... Uh, Take your mic up a little. In sequential treatment, the occlusion therapy started after some days uh, of wearing of the, the glasses. Yeah. So with the glasses, uh, with binocular vision, stereopsis developed better okay. in initial period. That is the theory. Yeah, or that is the theory. It is proved. Yeah, in pedic uh, study also, that is a big, big study about the pediatric. Yeah. yeah. They also uh, suggest the use of, uh, uh, of part-time occlusion therapy after the initiation of full-time glasses wear. Okay. Thank you. Any other question? So Hi. this was a prospective study, right? Yes, sir. So do you believe your results are uh, completely influenced by factors like confounding factors like selection bias? She's already mentioned that as one of the limitations. Was it there in your limitation? Yeah, no randomization. Sir, we have few limitations and uh, we are in working on that. No, uh, just my point is, do you think your results are reliable? 
sir with uh, this sample size and uh, with knowing that uh, we have few limitations we can say that the sequential treatment is better for the stereopsis recovery so what are the incidence of amblyopia suppose i'll go for a randomized study and calculate the sample size to have a uh, power of 80% so do you think 50 100 would work no sir the it sample size would be at least more than 500. Yeah. So with such a small sample without randomization, I don't think you should uh, conclude that ki this is better than that. Yes, you can say that this may be a better option. Yeah, this but may we be a better option study. and uh, we are in continuously in process of this uh, study. So maybe in so the next uh, uh, Basically, I am a cornea specialist, so I didn't understand your point. So patient is having unilateral amblyopia. You started with spectacles. And then after some time you did patching and you are claiming that that is going to benefit more. For stereopsis. Yes. Yeah, visual outcome is uh, almost same in both the groups. But stereopsis will be better group. if you give spectacle without patching. Just that is what I'm saying. It has yeah. been yeah. mentioned in the PEDIC study also okay. that this works better. It is one of the points but in the But what are the hypothesis study. behind that? The because idea is that both eyes are, both eyes are seeing. Yeah. Binocularity. So if I recover amblyopia, if I recover amblyopia with patching, then I give spectacles. So is it not going to help stereopsis? This is what no. this study no, says. No, 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 no. Uh, Why? It doesn't. Because, it doesn't. For, because uh, binocular vision is very important for stereopsis. Yes. And so stereopsis development usually takes at quite an early age. Anna? So what was the minimum uh, age range in your study? Three years. Three years. Three years. Yes, okay. Thank you. Oh, uh, just uh, as a corollary to her uh, paper, I would like to add that all of you in your own sphere, wherever you work, please don't restrict your treatment of amblyopia to any age. Try it even for older patients. It just might work. And if it does work, then imagine the benefit to that patient. So don't give up on them go for it. I'm saying this because I'm very fond of amblyopia uh, in any case, and I treat a lot of patients of amblyopia. So I have started treatment for patients even after the age of 20. I've tried it, and unfortunately, they get lost to follow up, but at the first visit, I found a difference of at least one meter in the vision of that patient, So, which encouraged me to think that we should never give up on them. At least let's try. Thank you. Any specific type of amblyopia or all type of amblyopia you would prefer? This uh, patient actually, uh, this patient, which I remember, she was a Muslim lady, uh, Muslim girl. She had uh, binocular amblyopia. Okay. So I put her on glasses, and there was no question of patching because it was binocular. So I just put her on glasses and told her to report back after a month, and uh, she improved because she wasn't wearing glasses earlier. So wearing of glasses is also very important. Okay, thank you so thank much. You. Next. Yeah. Nowadays we get more diagnosis because people are getting aware. And Please. Yes. Next speaker. Yeah. yeah. Next you can carry, uh, carry next forward. Next speaker, Gango Padhyay. He will be talking upon, on amplitude of accommodation in pre presbyopic uh, uh, diabetic patients. Good morning, my name is Dr. Prasad Gangopadha. Today I will be talking about the amplitude of accommodation in pre presbyopic diabetic patients. Diabetes affects the optics and biometry of the eye and blurring of vision is often the first sign of its presence. Crystalline lens of the human eye is one of the determinants of refraction. It is the only human organ that grows throughout the life of an individual. The lens becomes thicker and increasing age as new fibers are continually added over time. Accommodation is an increase in the diopteric or refractive power of the eye that enables near object to be focused on the retina. The increase in power of the eye occurs because of an increase in the anterior and posterior surfaces of the crystalline lens resulting from contraction of ciliary muscles. Amplitude of accommodation is the maximum amount of accommodation that can be exerted. The crystalline lens in young prepresbyopic patients with diabetes has been noted to be thicker and more convex when compared with non-diabetics. 
With increasing age, the crystalline lens becomes thicker and more convex, resulting a, a presbyopic patient would also require spectacle lens power to see near objects clearly. The diabetic eye acts like a presbyopic eye. With increasing age, the elasticity of the crystalline lens decreases and the amplitude of accommodation is reduced. The purpose of this study was to examine and compare the subjective push-up amplitude of accommodation in pre-presbyopic diabetic patients with age-matched healthy non-diabetic controls in order to better understand the effect of diabetes mellitus on accommodation. It was a cross-sectional hospital-based study performed in a rural tertiary hospital in West Bengal. 54 diabetic patients either with type 1 or type 2 diabetes were selected between the age of 30 and 40 years of age and 50 age-matched controls were selected for the study. Patients with type 1 and type 2 diabetes mellitus between the age of 30 and 40 years with a best corrected distant vision of equal, uh, equal to or um, uh, greater than 6 by 9 were selected for the study. Patients with cataractus lens, diabetic retinopathy, ocular trauma, previous ocular surgery on, or on medication of, uh, that affect accommodation like anticholinergic drugs and glaucoma were excluded from the study. A detailed ophthalmological examination including visual acuity, subjective refraction, color vision and anterior and posterior segment assessment was done followed by subjective amplitude of accommodation was measured with RAF, RAF rule using the push-up method. Subjects monocularly viewed the N5 line while wearing their distant correction determined the results from subjective refraction. Uh, the target N5 was placed in front of the subject's eye at 40 centimeters and the subject was asked to focus on the target with the right eye while the left eye was occluded. Each uh, subject was instructed to focus on the better line as the target was moved closer until the lateral line could no longer be held in clear focus and to report when it first became, uh, became and remained flurred, blurred. The, examination pushed, the examiner pushed the uh, target at a rate of approximately 5 centimeters per second. The end point of the test was the first sustained blur. After this, the other eye was also tested. Now, uh, the age, mean age and gender between the two groups were, compa were compared, there was no significant difference, hence we can say that our uh, study is age and gender matched. We can see from our results that the mean amplitude of accommodation in the diabetic group was significantly lower than the uh, control group. We also compared the type <coughs> of diabetes in the patients. It was also seen that in type 1 diabetes mellitus, the amplitude of accommodation was lesser than in type 2 diabetes. The average duration of diabetes among the study group was 8.12 years. There was a negative correlation between the amplitude of accommodation and the duration of diabetes. We also uh, looked into the diabetic control of the patients and, was, and found that mean amplitude of accommodation was seen to be uh, greater in patients with good control than in patients with poor control. Now there are several uh, previous studies that corroborate with our findings. Uh, the, in different studies, there has been some, some studies where there is only subjective uh, 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 technique was used and in some cases objective methods were used. But all come to a conclusion that the, in diabetic patients, there is a lower amplitude of accommodation. Now the possible hypothesis to explain the loss of accommodation could be that during the periods of hyperglycemia, there is an excess accumulation of glucose in the crystalline lens which is converted to sorbitol by aldose reductase enzyme and further converted into fructose by the sorbitol dehydrogenase enzyme. When the body of a diabetic person rapidly changes from a hyperglycemic to a hypoglycemic state, excess glucose in the crystalline lens flows into the aqueous humor, but the sorbitol remains in the lens for a longer period. This creates an osmotic gradient resulting in influx of water from the aqueous humor into the lens, producing marked swelling and thickness. The lens is mainly responsible for the loss of amplitude of accommodation in diabetic patients. However, there may be other possible contributors which include loss of ciliary muscle tone, adverse changes to the lens zonules, or deficit in neural input to the ciliary muscle, or changes in geometrical relationship between the lens and the accommodative structures. So from our study, we can conclude that patients with diabetes mellitus showed a lower amplitude of accommodation in comparison to healthy controls, making them susceptible to early onset presbyopia. Longer duration and poor control of diabetes also showed significant influence. Our study was not devoid of any limitations. There were, the sample size was quite small and we only looked into the subjective uh, push-up method and we did not look into the objective uh, methods. These are my references. Thank you. Dr. Pratiru. Uh, what were the refractive error status of those patients, those who, who have selected with the best corrected 6 by 9, whether they were myopic, whether they are hypermetropic? So most of the patients that we were looking for, were uh, we looked into, were ametropic patients uh, throughout their life and uh, they had... Uh, ametropic or ametropic? Ametropic. 
uh, because you have mentioned in your uh, materials and methods that you have inclusion criteria was best corrected visual acuity six by nine. So there must be some Please refractive some error. Refractive so errors, which uh, refractive error does it? Refract? This makes a difference. It, yeah, because it will be biased if you take myopic, myopic because yes. they will have a good accommodation. In hypermetropic, they will have pure accommodation. Yes. Pure poor. accommodation. That and is that too determining. No, yeah. Hyperhopes develop press myopia earlier. Yeah. This is a common yes. finding which all of us come across in our practice. Yeah, I have noted that. Yeah, yeah. Whether they are diabetic or not diabetic. Yeah, yeah. definitely. That doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very important uh, inclusion criteria you should have mentioned. Yes, Where what type of refractive type error? Of Yes, that would make your study complete, you know, because it makes a lot of difference. Because selected, uh, if you take uh, selectively these myopic patients, and then the study has got no meaning because yes. <laughs> only hypermetropic, then again uh, the study will have no meaning. So you have to have the proper selection of. Okay, how many patients were myopic? How many were uh, hyperopic? How many had mixed astigmatism or compound myopic? As some, you know, something like that. It should be refractive error based also, because this is an important factor in uh, judging whether actually diabetes is responsible for the pre uh, presbyopic error or or the refractive error per se. <laughs> that is a. Uh, sample size was very less and the collection was not very proper. Anyway, okay, madam. Thank you. Right. We call upon the next speaker, uh, Dr. Astha Gandhi, for the topic effect of conventional recession versus hangback sutures on corneal curvature and refraction. Is she there or not? Is she there? Otherwise, we'll go on to uh, the we'll next. On to next yeah. and we'll wait for her till the end of the session. Okay. Don't mark her not huh. present yet. Uh, okay. Next person uh, is Dr. Rik Shruti Deep. Deep. Shruti Deep. Please come. Let's do uh, uh, We'll end. leave it Please at present. Yeah, we'll give a chance. Yeah, we'll give a chance till the end. Yes, ma'am. See, we want them to present. True. Good morning. Uh, today, I'm going to be presenting my paper on treatment of anisometric <coughs> amblyopia using binocular therapy versus monocular therapy. Uh, I don't have any financial disclosures. So the earlier concept of amblyopia management was that uh, with advancing age at around 8 to 10 period, uh, 8 to 10 years, there is an end of critical period of visual plasticity. Uh, but now the newer concept is that uh, around 8 to 10 years, there are certain stop signals that do occur, but with the right kind of treatment with uh, by removing those stop signals, it is possible to train the brain and the eye to see better and to restore the visual plasticity. So in this regard, there is a new therapy that has recently been in, uh, uh, in serious study, and that is dicoptic therapy, wherein the dominant eye and the amblyopic eye uh, compete with each other for attention. So the con basic concept is that of interocular suppression, where there is a gating mechanism that is there from the dominant towards the amblyopic eye. So when the dominant eye is closed, as in the regular patching therapy, uh, the amblyopic eye uh, tends to take over and the interocular suppression ceases to exist. But the minute in a natural setting when the dominant eye is removed and the dominant eye takes over, thereby bringing in the suppression mechanism again. So what dicoptic therapy uh, attempts to do is to simultaneously stimulate both the eyes, thereby st ceasing to stimulate that particular interocular suppression pathway or that gating mechanism. So the objective of my study was to uh, study the efficacy of dicoptic versus monocular therapy in the treatment of anisometropic amblyopia in terms of logma vision, stereopsis contrast, and binocularity. So we included kids from 5 to 18 years and who were anisometropic amblyopia as per the EPOS guidelines with a vision of better than or equal to 6, 9, and 6. We excluded kids who had eccentric fixation, any history of prior amblyopia therapy, or any other form of amblyopia. So before starting therapy, we uh, check their logma distance vision, near uh, visual acuity, stereopsis through Randot, worth 4 dot, and also did a contrast sensitivity. So we uh, enrolled consecutive subjects, 15 in dicoptic, 15 in monocular. Uh, they all underwent pre-therapy evaluation, following which they underwent 10 hours of therapy over 10 days. So one hour a day of therapy. They were the snake game, shooting game, and a couple of other games. And then they were evaluated post-therapy uh, after the 10 days. 
So the software used was the Lazy Eye Arcade, which is from the Waverly Eye Care Center in Winnipeg, California. It's a paid software. Uh, so how we actually uh, separated them into groups was the same software game was used. Uh, for the dichoptic group, we put them on red-blue goggles. We selected the amblyopic eye and then for the non-amblyopic eye or the dominant eye, we reduced the contrast settings to 20%. So the concept is that we reduce the contrast to the dominant eye, thereby allowing the weaker eye to see better and get stimulated. In monocular therapy, we used, used the same game without goggles. We patched the dominant or the non-amblyopic eye and gave 100% contrast settings to the non-amblyopic eye. So that's how we <coughs> put them into two groups. So this is how the uh, game looks. For example, this is the snake game. So the target here is going to be in, uh, the left eye, which is uh, the dominant eye for say, and right eye, if the right eye, is domin uh, right eye is the amblyopic eye. So this is how it would look through the red, and this is how it looked to the right. When placing both eyes, and if you put the dominant eye on 20% contrast, this is how it would look. So the dominant eye is actually much lesser than the non-dominant. This is just a short clipping of how the video game is played. So you have the red as the player and the blue as the target. And so thereby it's simultaneous stimulation uh, occurs, whereas the amblyopic eye gets the higher contrast. That so with the goggles. It's with the yes. goggles, yes. So this is the pre-therapy comparison. So we had uh, 15 uh, subjects in both the groups. Mean age was slightly older in the dichoptic group than the monocular group. Spherical equivalent was 6.3 and 6.23. Mean axial length was 25.8 and 25. Pre-therapy 0.49 and 0.40 was the logma visual acuity and uh, stereo acuity was 300 and 150. Mean contrast was almost similar. So when it comes to uh, logma visual acuity, we found that uh, there was a uh, good improvement in the both the groups. Mean gain of letters, dichoptic therapy, there were five letters. Monocular therapy, mean of seven letters. Again, uh, in terms of near visual acuity, uh, dichoptic therapy, 11 of them improved to uh, N6, and in monocular, nine. Uh, mean contrast sensitivity, there was a good improvement from 1.5 to 1.9, 1 1.6 to 1.95. Mean stereopsis, 300 to 270, 170 to 55. So almost all were statistically not too significant. The positive predictive factors were the age, pre-therapy visual acuity, and the stereopsis. So when we look at the literature, we look at other studies that have shown uh, dichoptic therapy to be non-inferior, and that's similar to what we found, that it's non-inferior to monocular patching therapy. Uh, we found a, a logmar improvement of 0 0.09, and this also concurred with the PDIC study as well as the uh, newer binocular movie therapy that is coming up re in recently. So to conclude, dichoptic therapy is an exciting new therapy. Uh, from what we saw, it is non-inferior to the monocular therapy. Uh, it is a good option, but uh, uh, it really doesn't provide a superior effect. Visual outcomes and contrast sensitivity do show improvement after 10 hours, especially for the older children. And the positive predictive factors uh, include younger age group, pre-therapy, pre visual acuity, and stereopsis. Thank you. Thank you. My question is, you showed in your paper that uh, in fact, the, uh, in, instead of the dichoptic group, the monocular group showed better yes. results. Yes. So then what is the advantage of the dichoptic uh, therapy? So, so it is, what we did see was the statistical significance was not there. So we can just say it's non-inferior and for older age groups. If we see, we started out with older age groups for the dichoptic but therapy. But it's a paid uh, game, no? Yes, you have to buy yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So, so, so from my results, I'm not saying it is a better therapy, definitely not a better therapy to monocular. Uh, uh, I, the results are good for older children. So that's then, what probably. is the use of your paper? Yeah. If it is not superior, yeah, you should I have see no uh, reason to present it uh, unless it is showing a better outcome yeah. than monocular therapy. Yeah. Why would yeah. someone yeah. want to go for it, pay for it, and then not have a better result? Uh, Ma'am, I'm not saying my, the therapy works. I'm just presenting my results, which shows it's Agreed, not good. I'm just presenting my results. results show that it, it doesn't. Yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm just saying it's. For that software. Yes, software. so I, I cannot directly recommend. That I'm just saying the results of mine that are not supporting what, that. Yeah. That is the conclusion I yes. think we should take home. Yes, definitely. And <laughs> another Dr. point Shruti, I uh, wish to make is that uh, every patient of yours is not in a position to buy the game, you know? Yes. Because we get uh, patients from all strata. I know. So, and how much does it cost, by the way? Uh, the, the software is a paid software. One time it costs 7,000 rupees. My God. But one time you buy it, you can use it as an in-office therapy forever. But Dr. Shruti, you said a lot of uh, advances going on in this field. 
yes. in western countries yes sir like so why would they do that if you your finding suggests it's not useful yes sir so monocular the, therapy is better uh, so are there any studies done in outside world where they have found specific benefit of this therapy almost all of the studies done so far in dicoptic specifically do not show promising results they so what are its advantage see if something is not working then people are not going to explore it right. right so why people are investing so much into this why i will tell you sir now they are now coming up with movie based therapies for this and these have been shown to the earlier studies and similar to this what we have done they are very so my point is do it give any advantage it may not be uh, final visual may not be right but is it giving you any logistic advantage or therapy uh, or maybe parents compliance uh, is yes, it uh, does I, it give you any advantage right sir so the thing it gives us is a short term effect a quicker effect that is the one thing that it gives and second is visual attention because patching includes a lot of compliance issues it takes time so, so this is what i think the, yeah. the the issue of compliance may be better yes. with those therapies yes. and may be suited for western people will move, which are more no, educated but in I indian would, patient may I not would be disagree with that also the compliance is not better with these games because i have put some patients on non paid games which were available you know the tumbling yeah, blocks yeah. and all but children get bored very easily yeah. of these games so the attention is lost probably that is the reason they are coming out movies exactly yes, sir <laughs> they won't get bored one thing i wanted to answer your question was why the western world does it kuch naya karna hai kuch to naya kare at least dekhe so isliye maybe maybe with new it. new technology Haan, they may come out with something yes. good Haan. So the older studies were a big failure because the games were so boring and they were so monotonous. Yes, absolutely. So that's why they now they are exploring binocular movies, movies. wherein they the same that suppression and they have interesting studies where they have compared. So your next study movies. will be on movies, I guess. Yeah, your next paper would <laughs> be on that. <laughs> next AIS, yes, we can judge you again. Yes, chalo. Thank you so much. Thank you. Asta Gandhi, are you back? next author is pallavi joshi yeah dr pallavi joshi she will be presenting on learning curve in uh, the construct of smartphone based uh, keratoscope prototype for keratoconus uh, screening good afternoon everybody uh at the outset i would like to thank the esteemed guests for this opportunity so uh, i'll be speaking to you all about the it's not coming on the and you know to in the meantime we do question answering you can come and you start your ppt right you should be ready the next person otherwise yeah, we'll lose out <laughs> because then you see because then we can discuss the paper in a better way so that the message goes out to everybody otherwise we don't have enough time you know we have to wind up so okay. even if it is an interesting paper then we don't get time Shall I okay so uh, i'm talking about learning curve in the construct of a smartphone based keratoscope for screening keratoconus no financial uh, interest we all know that keratoconus is a progressive bilateral ectatic condition and unfortunately when they come in advanced cases which post covid we have really seen we have no options but to do transplants early detection and treatment to arrest is something we all know and is very essential so the prevalence of keratoconus is you know one in 2000 in india it is very high mainly because of steeper corneas thin as well as the dust conditions with eye rubbing and the investigation modalities like from the placidos based like opticons to those as tomographies like pentacam they are available but these are all non portable and very expensive so the early diagnosis becomes actually inaccessible for the large section of population in the middle and low income people so our study basically aimed for a collaborated study with the software professionals the microsoft and an attempt was created to create one smartphone based keratoscope based on the keraton based topography so this is how we created one model and validate validated so in this study we try to understand what is the steep learning curves by applying optics in getting the picture and then looking at how to improve the quality of image and making it comparable to that of a standard keratron machine and so here i tell you about our struggle 
So this, this is our smart KC, which you can see there, which I have uh, depicted. And here we had a lot of you know, teething problems. The first was which placido is designed to take. We are all aware there are three types, one planar, ellipsoid, as well as the conical. We know the ellipsoid and planars will not occupy the whole of the cornea. So eventually we narrowed down to take a conical placido's head with 28 rings and had a 70 millimeters radius. So this is what we took as the placido's ring and we went ahead with the conical well-fitting one. Then we took the pictures but we realized we were coming with something called as the gap dot. So as you see where the cornea touches this ring, this gap what gets created, if it is very much close, we get as if there is a pseudo steepening and a false red heat map. So this thing, we went ahead and used the AI and did a simulation on the computer using same type of lightning as we use in the keratron, created a, a spherical pseudo cornea and started creating pictures. So here we didn't use lot of devices, we just did it and come, came out with an algorithm of regression formula to consider how to calculate before analyzing this working distance. Then we had problems of tilts and offset because we had to put it to the patient, we can have either up or down or sometimes it is away. So to take care of this, we came out with an interesting thing that we got a small red cross in the center so that when the red cross is there only the picture is captured. So just to show you all, this is our machine, how it is actually assembled. And this is the simplest machine. Here we have the LEDs which are attached to the smartphone. This is the cap and you can see the small button paper which is there. The gray color which is placed inside. Attached and the gray picture. To tell you, the cost of making this is just 2500 extra the smartphone. The paper is 2 rupees. show it in this form where you can see this is the pipeline then we use the arch step method of creating the cornea use a Zernica polymer and create the heat map on the basis of diapters so the litmus test after doing this was we wanted to validate whether our machine is functioning or no so we took two ophthalmologists compared them by giving them 101 eyes of both from the keratron as well as this machine and try to find out Initially, we found a gross difference between two surgeons because the specificity was coming down. We didn't know what was happening. We realized that the SIMK calculation was going wrong. The machine normally calculates it as the steepest at 90 degrees, the flattest at 3 millimeters, but we were taking it 5. So once this got corrected, actually if you go to see, after correction, it became 100%. So with this correction, this is how comparable images, the one which you can see on your this side is the keratron and on the other side is our smart KC. Very comparable heat maps were obtainable. Thus, our smart KC achieves sensitivity of 94% and specificity of 100% as comparable to that of a keratron. And the SIMK values also were significantly comparable. So prior studies of smartphone have been done. You're asking what must be this that you're showing. Majority of studies are done, but the number of eyes they have analyzed or validated are less. Second, they always had something like a chin rest or a stand, so it was less portable. And most important is, to our best knowledge, this is the only one end-to-end -end implementation of real-time checking, getting images, and also getting it into the form of a, um, uh, heat maps. So our limitations are there. Like, though 100 is not enough, and only one machine has been used, as well as we still have to do it on different machines. So to conclude, I would want to tell you all that the smart KC which we have created has good sensitivity and a better specificity than Keratron. Second, this gives us an important 
amalgamation of optics with the Microsoft people, means technicians, and also with the ophthalmologists. This kind of combination comes out with a very, very useful, socially impactful um, uh, you know, instruments, which would always make us sure that we don't miss on those patients who are missed. I would like to acknowledge Dr. Mohit Nipun from the Microsoft, who is part of this, our fellows in optometry for this. We want everybody to see the rainbow, and more definitely, not make those miss what they'd already seen. So thank you a lot. Brilliant, Thank brilliant. You. I loved it. It's innovative, it's cheap, and exactly what we want for Atmanirbhar Bharat, I think. Mm. <laughs> Made in India, by India. Yes, yes. So, excellent job. Thank you. Yes. I think this should be marketed, you know. I you have it? Yeah, I just brought it if you want. She's brought it to show everybody. Please see it. This just, it is out of curiosity. This is no. it's not the nylon uh, yes. imprint, which is looks okay. snugly. Inside you can see this is the conical yes. placidos ring. Yes. It has the gaps in which we put a small butter paper, actually. Okay. So that, that creates the reflection. Okay. This kind of a butter paper, Great and idea. it comes like that. And this is a small microscope where the LEDs are. Perfect. With uh, Dr. Pallavi, yes. excellent part so far. Your innovation is there, Thank but you. I would have uh, loved to hear more about the study that you did. Yes. I know. So about the, uh, did you try it in 100% uh, all? How many were came positive? So uh, you didn't say anything. I told that, sir. We so did it uh, on 101 eyes, okay. in which we had fi uh, 50 of them with keratoconus. The other were non-keratoconic, and non-keratoconic also. We had a few who were non-refractive errors, means normal and few with refractive errors. No, that my is point is, uh, you are uh, using this as a screening tool, right? Yes. So what are the chances that if I use this, how, in how, how many percentage of cases I will diagnose a case of keratoconus early? 98.6 is the sensitivity. 100% is, I will not falsely label anybody as keratoconus. Okay. Yes. Very good, yes, yes. That is because of the use of that regression formula, whereas in keratron, because it is at the chin rest, the distance is more. So we get actually a little bit false uh, negatives in so the So what are the positive. limitations of using this as this a screening tool? Uh, one thing is, as I said, uh, we have tried it only on one mobile, but we know that any with 12 megapixels we can use. Second thing is the still thing which is there, we're actually already into it, into a process of making it corrected by an algorithm. So it's a process happening and we have actually reached far more than what I have presented okay, today. Going but one step ahead each time. Yes, That's yes, definitely, definitely. Thank you. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, actually not patented. We have made it open access. We don't want to get anything out of it except no, that patients should benefit out of no, it. No, are there you other must patent it. <laughs> no, are there patent other it. Uh, yes. Similar to this technique, are there any other device people are using? Yeah, world pe over? people have made. But the thing is, uh, what here we have used is we have also used the data we have of previous keratrons, okay. which are helping us to create the deep learning and creating a kind of heat maps which will give us even you know in the future progression assessments also thank you yes, yes i think this combination of engineers and medicos is working brilliantly definitely definitely, definitely i yeah. i'm really i'm yes. impressed yes you know, thank you seriously thank you and please convey that to the engineers yes surely surely i will yes thank you next next person dr namrata sri are you there namrata absent they are leaving, they are not going. Next. The previous one, Asta Gandhi. Let her present last. Hello. Dr. Jyoti Matalia. So Dr. Jyoti Matalia will be presenting a paper on an integrated approach to flatten the myopic curve. Okay. Good afternoon, all. Yes, I'm going to be talking on an integrated approach to flatten the myopia curve. It's not coming here. Yes. Mm. No, it's yeah. As you're aware, it's one of the most common ocular disorder with a high prevalence now even in India. But unfortunately, the cause... It's not moving. The cause in pathogenesis is not understood. In fact, the impact of COVID pandemic has caused that in school-going children significant high myopic progression. But there are certain challenges, and hence, managing this is becoming an issue. So with this idea in mind, we had a myopic management personalized by artificial intelligence, integrating in imaging, biomechanics, and molecular factors. It was a prospective comparative study done with ethics committee approval. What was the rationale? We know myopia is associated with hereditary 
lifestyle changes, there's coronary biomechanics and topography, and molecular dopamine, all of this can be known to either prevent or treat the pyopic progression. But do we really know there's an association? With this in mind, we decided our methodology where we're starting with the questionnaire to address the hereditary and lifestyle changes, where we ask questions related to daytime sleep and nighttime sleep, outdoor activities, then screen time, Hereditary, especially where there is associated parents and having it because it increases much more if they have parents having myopia. Dopamine related to mood and dietary. Once we address the question, we actually measure dopamine using the tear film from the Shermer strips and applying Eleazar clit. We know that dopamine is one of the most important neurotransmitters with a role in eye growth regulation because decreased levels causes neural dysregulation and increased growth elongation developing myopia. We have already published that dopamine can be detected in human tear films and it is correlates that with the plasma uh, dopamine levels. So this we finally included 206 children with only purely myopia and no other ocular symptoms or systemic close illnesses. Excuse, Those were Excuse me, please close the door. This included 50 metropes and 156 myopes of which 45 are mild myopia with refractive error less than minus 3. 60 moderate myopes between minus 3 to minus 6 and 51 high myopes more than minus 6. We also followed them over, uh, followed them of these 163 patients. So we found there was a decreased fluid dopamine levels in myopes and of these mild to moderate had significantly different level indicating that those with emetropes had higher levels. We also compared dopamine levels to myopia progression and found that at levels 1, 3, 3, 5, 6 um, picograms per ml there was a significant AUC of 0 0.3, uh, 0 0.73, indicating a high sensitivity of 82. But dopamine was not different between those that who stabled and progressed. Interestingly, we noticed that when we apply the questionnaire and dopamine levels, we noticed there was an increase in level of more than, um, in those which were playing out outdoors for more than two hours. Then we came to the next aspect of Corvus and Pentagram. We have previously published that there is an association between in 733 pediatric eyes that were having different grades of myopia, and found that it was neg negatively correlating with the grade of myopia, that is corneal biomechanics. But obviously we could not predict it with my myopic progression. So let's apply it in this study. So we found out, uh, we applied all the patients underwent Corvus and Pentacam uh, parameters of which 61 indices and 27 of each were together used and for prediction. Where we applied artificial intelligence, that is clause validated logistic regression level. In that, for detection of myopia, we got this. The first split was at dopamine, which was more than 12871, and found that those with a high AC depth were myopics, and in those with a A2 deflection length, that is on Corvus, were found to be more myopic. Those with coma of more than 0 0.03 and RMS of lower order aberration more than 1.79 were found to be myopic. So this had a precision of about 0 0.77. And if you compare that with emetropes and myope, myopia prediction was about almost 80%. When we applied for myopia progression, we realized that the first split was axial length. And then if you have an axial length of more than 23, with a child watching TV more than 30 minutes, age less than 11, and playing less outdoors was progressive. Similarly, for those which had less spherical power, lesser age, and playing more uh, iPad also was progressing. So this had a precision of 0 0.78 with stability of 88%. So what we already knew is dopamine is uh, available uh, in only adults and corneal biomechanics and dopamine is related to myopia. But this study shows that it is a first study for tear dopamine in myopic children, non-invasive, correlates dopamine and corneal biomechanics with grades of myopia and its progression and actually confirms the role of actual length, outdoor activity and screen time in predicting myopia progression. But yes, we need to have more robustness in clinical translation of these observations and longer serial follow-ups. So what does all this mean in clinical implication? So we know that actual length plays a role. We also know age parameter plays a role and outdoor activity. So what it does is then you have a, a child who has an actual length less than 23. You have somebody who is watching TV more than th uh, watching TV less than 30 minutes with a spherical power less than two and having less iPad is stable. So in these conditions, if you are allowing and you follow these patients, you can purely put them on lifestyle modifications, only cutting, increase, cutting down the screen time, letting them go play outdoors much more, and that will help. But those where you see, where they are having a larger actual length, where you notice that they are having more time to spend, like they are studying longer hours, they are in higher standards, and they have a chance of progressing, those can be followed up closely, and eventually may start medication. Thus, we would like to conclude that AI-assisted processing of extended cohort-based information will eventually help us 
in early detection, prevention, and management strategy for myopia because myopia is now already started but going to be a sooner pandemic just like COVID. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Very good study. I think it can be very useful clinically in yes. years to come. But the only problem is, yes, as you said, what we need to know are basic things. Yes. Like uh, how much the child watches TV, yes. what's the age, what is the myopia at right. start level, how much does he play out. So all these things are something which in any general practitioner Exactly. Can any general so, ophthalmologist can also do. Yeah, so this questionnaire is what we actually introduce. If you introduce a questionnaire and you ask these questions, realize where they fall in, and yeah. you know they are going to be in the stable level, just follow them up. If you feel they may have a chance that they are going to progress, like in children who are in 10th standard are not going to cut down the amount of reading, you know they have a chance of progressing. Those patients can be put on an early follow-up and start on treatment and monitor them on the basis of the same guidelines that we are putting. Thank you, Dr. Jyoti. I have one uh, doubt. See, whatever you are saying, that is like a didactic lecture. You are guiding us, this you should do, this you should do. But this is a pre-paper presentation. Did you study your patients? Did you collect any data using this integrated approach? Yeah, and the, did you find uh, anything that... So whatever I have told is entirely on the basis of 206 patients that I have got. This is not what I am assuming. In these 206 patients, we realized that those patients who had an actual length of a particular level... So what was the uh, percentage of cases that you find out... I'm sorry? So, could you have any data out of the 261 patients? Yeah, I exactly showed 206 patients of which we had 45 mild myope, 60 moderate and 51 high. And of these, we noticed that those who progressed had an actual length more than 25, who are spending more times indoors, who are not going outdoors, who are more screen time. So this is whatever I've shown AI is on the basis of the patients, not something which I am just generally telling. Okay. This is the artificial intelligence was applied on the group of my patients and then found, and we also have e-metropes in which we show them nothing. So we had a control group which did not show progression. This was comparing. So we eventually got a particular set of AI showed which could stay stable and could progress. So this can be applied clinically so that even for general ophthalmologists, we can be able to show that this really works because we always say outdoor you should go, but does it really work? So this study showed that it is working on the set of our 206 patients. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, at the outset, let us thank uh, All India Academic Society for the chance. Uh, a very good afternoon to the judges and my dear friends in the audience. I will be speaking on a novel optical OCT to study collagen in suspect versus normal corneas. I have no financial interest in the disclosure. So uh, you know, at uh, you obviously know about the evolution of various screening tools in refractive surgery, whether it is topographers, whether it is biomechanical devices and ob obviously of late a lot of hybrid devices uh, such as MS-39 no financial interest which have helped us look quite deeper but in spite of all of these technologies there is something still always ambiguous especially in a certain set of cases where they generally don't correlate you see tomography being normal but you look at biomechanics it is abnormal uh, you know cases where the structure and biomechanics are real aren't really matching is where uh, our research question was as to what do we uh, you know go further and look into um, you know this can in fact impact the way we are treating uh, patients uh, you know patients with seemingly normal topographies we still see many of them or at least a cohort of them uh, developing ectasias. What are the additional factors is what we wanted to know. Now understanding ultrastructural imaging is actually what we wanted to build where you know there have been a lot of work where we have looked at collagen. Um, you know finally when we are looking at ectasias or we are looking at the risk of development into ectasias. It is the structure of the collagen which is important and how strong and compact the collagen is, is what is important. And that is obviously a lacunae in the current devices because we do not study the collagen and uh, you know the need is to study the collagen and the existing technologies whether it is x-ray diffraction, electron microscopy cannot be very very feasible in you know translating it into the clinics. And what we wanted to do is 
find out whether is there a non-invasive way to study this collagen fibril orientation and distribution. So we you know, looked at an aspect of something known as polarization properties of light. Now what happens is when we're looking at light, you know, whether it's from the lamp, it's from the tube light, it's from the sunlight, they have, an, it's an electromagnetic wave, they generally have waves in two phases which are perpendicular to each other. When it passes through something known as a polarizing filter, okay, so in this case I'm talking about the ocular tissue. There are certain tissues which depolarize the light, but what I mean by depolarizing is the light waves in two phases are filtered out and it allows light only in one phase to pass through. So the co cornea per se, if you're looking at the epithelium, if you're looking at the uh, endothelium and the Bowman's are polarizing, preserving. So they do not really, uh, you know, the rays which pass through, pass through just the same way. But when you're looking at the stroma where majority of the collagen is, it is a depolarizing uh, uh, tissue where it allows rays of only one phase to pass through. So this is what, what aspect we wanted to look at and we built the polarization sensitive OCT. Obviously a team collaboration, this is uh, almost two, three years in work. Um, and how is it different? I mean, uh, how is this OCT different from the existing tools? Uh, you know, you're looking at the center frequency being the same, but you know, uh, if you go to the maximum detector where we are, there is a spectrometer which has a higher wavelength. What does it do is it, to summarize, it gives us a better resolution uh, and it also gives us a better, you know, width as to where we are actually imaging. So, you know, structures such as Bowman's and epithelium, the, you know, the axial resolution is much better, the pixel density is much better and that is how you know polarization sensitive OCT can revolutionize the way we look. So uh, this is the information it gives. Importantly is something an information which not other devices give is looking at the collagen orientation. So uh, though this is a new device we have obviously started building normative database. Um, you know uh, we looked at a cohort of patients which are both normals as well as suspicious. 50 normals and 35 suspicious cases. Now these obviously went through the cases of you know a routine evaluation which includes uh, tomography which includes biomechanics and we also then extrapolated and looked at what is what are the changes you're seeing at the level of collagen now what is interesting is uh, you know if you're looking at cases suggestive of a normal tomography uh, well you look at this collagen distribution now you might ask as to how i'm actually arriving at a normative uh, pattern you know keith meek did a work in vivo where he uh, you know hypothesized the distribution of collagen especially with these peripheral anchoring interlacing fibrils which is important so this is a kind of pattern which we have seen and in patients where we did look at you know suspicious cases whether it's a form pressed keratoconus we in we did see a partial loss of orientation and arrangement of collagen in these cases um, this obviously can extrapolate to clinical practice like I said, there are conditions where tomography and biomechanics really do not match. Uh, and in such scenarios where, well, you are not really certain biomechanics is abnormal, tomography is borderline, uh, this could, uh, you know, give us an indication as to the actual structural integrity of the cornea. Now, what is also important is it gives you something known as a Bowman's imaging because it's a higher resolution. Remember, though there is a structural change at the level of collagen, Bowman's thinning and mild stretching is in fact an earlier change of earlier or of, of uh, an ectasian evolution. And therefore, understanding this is still work in evolution. Understanding Bowman's in addition to collagen is something which is very important. So, I mean, we obviously know that corneal tomography is the gold standard. This is in fact the first polarization sensitive OC in the world where we are looking at collagen orientation and arrangement, uh, what we conclusively found out is that in cases of suspicious corneas, collagen and the distribution of collagen was something which was altered significantly and this is important, you know, this can actually precede changes in the tomography and that is why uh, tools like polarization sensitive OCT can change the way we are imaging. So to conclude, uh, you know, this is again, uh, it's an instrument which is still in informative years, we have not yet built for in normative database, we're still doing that and this can be extrapolated to retinal imaging and glaucoma as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Gehrig. So what was the purpose of presenting this paper? You wanted to update us about this technique or what? No, so uh, uh, polarization sensitive OCT is a tool right what we uh, have arrived is this is the first paper which is looking at structural differences in collagen in cases which we really cannot distinguish basically on a tomography or biomechanics so now have you tried in any uh, uh, 
patience in your setup where you th this could make a difference so uh, uh, you know uh, what patients where we look at tomography being normal looking at biomechanics being abnormal now what we found is that patients who are borderline uh, a collagen and orientation of collagen and studying the collagen is actually the final thing because the tools which we have right now in our so is it making any difference in your clinical practice this is my point yes it is as as a part of our screening protocol in cases at at least in our center in cases where we have these kind of conundrums or in issues in terms of not them not matching we actually as of now base our judgment on the type of procedure we're going to do based on you know the collagen distribution refractive procedure yes so yes, uh, that is another set of cohort where we have looked at. Uh, so it is not going to increase excuse the collagen. Me, excuse me, one minute. I think we are going to have to cut, cut short this discussion right. because we have to finish one keynote address and there's two more papers. All right. If the absent person comes, so if Dr. So Nilanjan, I think your turn is right next. So please. Is he there? Doctor the next. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Doctor Nilanjan Chaudhary. Okay, we'll wait. Let's have the keynote address then uh, by Dr. Venkat uh, Prabhakar Gururu. Is he there? No, he's not. He's not. He's not. He's not. He's not. He's not. We have still 10 minutes. We still have 10 minutes. Is the first Second person year. available? Yes. The one who was not there? Dr. Astha Gandhi? Is she there? No? Okay. Any bad? And then uh, Namrata Shri also absent. And uh, these two also. Dr. Niranjan Chaudhary, once more I'm asking for the final time. No? Nobody is there. Achha, okay. should have a good discussion. So you okay. have completed your point, uh, Doctor. Yeah. Post uh, C3 we have, uh, this is another cohort not included here, but we have done studies on uh, sequential imaging post uh, cross-linking over a period of time. Now, I'm not saying that collagen is going to increase, but uh, in terms of uh, the orientation and the stability, this is something which we still have data of only a year. Maybe in the next uh, All India Ophthalmic Society, I would be in a better position to present our uh, interim analysis on that. Yeah. So, but as of now, because this is a new instrument, we have imaged maybe about 4,000, 5,000 so uh, eyes. Point, this is giving us the orientation of collagen. Orientation right? and uh, yes. So what I spoke about in the last slide is looking at zonal maps, which is retardation maps. So at each zone, we are now trying to quantify as what is normal. Because finally, everybody will want to know that yeah, you are not true. using a color pattern. You want to quantify it. That is something which we're still doing, looking at the various zones, whether it's 0 to 2, 2 to 4, 6 to 8 millimeters. And is and it giving you any specific depth or is the overall orientation? Because co collagen orientation this is predominantly entry. posterior stromal. Okay, we are looking for the yes, posterior yes, elevation, yes, which is the earliest yes. change. Okay, that's, that's a good approach. My, Thank you. Uh, my only contention is that these types of instruments and this type of research is only possible in... Uh, Institutes like Narayana. Right. So yeah. what I wanted to honest. yes, the, what I wanted to tell know. in that is that no, no doubt these are research tools. Our final aim is not to tell you that you need to own a polarization sensitive OCT, but Sensitive. what we're trying to do is building a normative database. And our next step is trying to collaborate indices and various instruments. So you might have a biomechanical tool. So Which of those say, parameters we in are the not saying it's a bad tool, it's an excellent tool. We are not saying that <laughs> at all. If, if, even if it's not useful clinically, it will help us understand how this keratoconus, early keratoconus, right. all yes. this thing works. And the okay. distribution of so collagen. That's yes. an excellent yes. tool. Yes. So, okay, fine. Thanks. Thank you. So, with that, we come to an end of this session. We have finished a little early. So, I think we can go ahead with the photographs and we can go for an early lunch. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> All of us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I think all the participants, participants, they can come. Yeah, they can come. Please come forward. All the presenters also we can yes, have. All the presenters, all the judges. All topics were good. Uh, we would like to congratulate each presenter. <laughs> Eight